Okay, okay, we'll try to get Doom running on this thing. Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? You may remember this device from a previous video. If you haven't watched it yet, you might want to because it'll fill in a lot of the gaps for you, but Real quick, this is basically a small PC that gets installed in restaurants and commercial kitchens that drives the monitors that tells the people who do all the cooking and meal prep and all that what orders are coming through, what needs to get made, that sort of thing. We found out last time that this thing has some very interesting hardware. Specifically, the CPU is kind of an SOC based around the original Pentium but it's got some other modern components like DDR3 RAM and a video chip that's connected through PCIe. We didn't look too closely at the software last time, but that's what we're gonna do today. Since that previous episode, I found that a few people on Twitter had actually gone out and purchased these units. Thankfully, they got used ones just for playing around with. They found these things that interesting and together we've all kind of learned some interesting stuff about these devices. I'm just gonna get this one hooked up and I'll show you what I mean. So a screen like this is kind of where we left off last time where I just went through some of the basic options and showed you stuff. We did determine that this thing runs a DOS-like operating system, but I wasn't really sure how to get any further into it. What I do know is when you plug a keyboard into the unit through PS2, it can detect that a keyboard is plugged in and will automatically open this setup screen. It, without a keyboard attached, it just goes straight into the application. This one, of course, you can set all sorts of network settings and what type of software it's running and all that, but other than this screen or the application that it automatically boots into, there's really not a whole lot else you can do, uh, except we've figured out how. At this screen, if you hit Control C, you can hit Y to terminate the batch job, and it'll take you to a command prompt. Here's what's interesting. This isn't MS-DOS, but it's also not free DOS. This thing runs a different version called XDOS. What's crazy though is I can find hardly any information about this. Clearly it's one of those DOS derivative type of OSs. You know, like FreeDOS, MS-DOS, PC-DOS, DR-DOS, DIP-DOS. There have been a bunch over the years and this is clearly one of them. Now, the problem is that HBS Corp or Thierry Giron, I can't find any information about them. They've got a 1991 date in there, obviously, but I can tell you that it's a fairly small installation. There's really not a whole lot going on to it. And as you can see by the output of the dir command above, there's really not a whole ton of files going on in this system either. Like if we switch to that DOS folder. There's just two files, sys.com and ed.exe, and that ed.exe is your basic text editor application. And if we do something like editing the autoexec bat file, it's very simple as well. Basically, it automatically will launch sex setup that sex setup then checks for the presence of a keyboard. If not found, it exits itself automatically. And otherwise it rolls through some other tasks, one of which is really interesting to see if there's an update available. I also found out a little bit more about the different customers that can use this software. Switch to this, I don't know, certified, I guess is what that's short for directory. You can see there's actually quite a few in here, and these are all of the individual apps that this device can run based on what, I guess, company or point of sale system you're using. And some of these I can actually kind of recognize. Micro is Micros Systems, NCR, National Cash Register. You might have heard of them. The one that caught my eye, though, was 
Starbucks. Now that's all fine, but barring having access to a point of sale system, which I don't, that kind of is the end of the line for exploring this unit. Now, obviously I wanna try and do some other fun stuff with it, but this particular unit, like I said in the previous video, well, it's on loan to me and I really can't start modifying or trying to hack it because if I break it, as we also discussed last time, these are quite expensive to replace. So, um, I just went out and bought my own. As you can tell, they're very similar, but there are some slight differences. This is definitely an older model, especially based on some of the button layouts and also the wear on the number one button. I'm pretty sure the two have the same hardware on the inside. However, there are probably some other minor differences, which may or may not be inconsequential. But the big thing is that I was able to pick this up so I can do whatever I want with it. And we're definitely gonna be going on a little bit of a journey today. Let me show you what I found out. So obviously we wanna be able to try to run Doom on this thing, right? That's what you all want. And that's what I am hopefully going to be able to deliver. However, I think there are some options for potentially running some other stuff on here as well. Got this piece of foam that'll serve to insulate. I don't really want to deal with disconnecting this keyboard membrane. The pins on it are fairly tight and getting them back in there may become a bit of a pain. So we took apart one of these units in that previous episode and I told you all about the parts. The things that have me interested in this one are obviously this SD card slot, but also one thing that I noticed is the other unit that we took apart, there's a, a USB port that's easily accessible from the outside. This particular unit doesn't have that, at least not from the outside, but the USB port is still there. So that's an obvious revision change, making the USB port accessible on the newer versions of these well, they're branded Oasis iPads. These are commonly called bump bars. I guess the idea is as they're showing the orders on screen, you can press the buttons on the keypad to clear those orders out. I guess the idea behind the terminology is that you're bumping the order off the screen, which is why they're commonly called bump bars, I guess. But having access to the USB port also can open up some options. But I figured the SD card slot was probably the better place to start. So I built an SD card with a copy of DOS on it. And there's another major thing that I learned as part of those folks who were also goofing around with these on Twitter. L let me show you what that is. If you start it up while mashing F12 and you've got to be really quick, you get a boot selection menu. This also leads to some other interesting information, specifically the BIOS. This CBIOS is apparently an open source project, which I didn't know that there was such a thing as an open source BIOS. I mean, I, I guess, but that's what these devices run. The bummer is that while you can get to the boot selection menu, you can't get into the BIOS configuration screen. It's completely locked out. I can't find any key commands that let you get into it. I suspect the only way to actually go in and make any changes or unlock the selection screen would be to flash a different BIOS onto this device, which is just way out of my breadth of knowledge. I'm not even gonna try. The bummer though is because you can't change the boot order, by default, it always wants to boot to the SPI flash disk, which is the little bit of onboard flash memory soldered to the motherboard. And that's what has that built-in XDOS installation. It basically acts like a virtual floppy drive, which is why that command prompt came up as A colon. What's interesting though, is it will see the SD card slot and treat it like an SD to IDE adapter, and it'll show up in the boot selection menu. So in this case, I've got a copy of FreeDOS installed on that SD card. And as you can see, it like loads just fine. The bummer is that every time you power the device on, it wants to automatically boot to that built-in flash instead of the SD card. So you've got to manually get into that boot selection screen every single time and tell it, no, 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 boot off of the SD card. 
So I was starting to kind of lose patience with SD cards because I'll tell you this. My ultimate goal for this whole project, for our video today, is not just to run Doom on this. I want it to be a complete soft mod. I want you to be able to go up to any one of these devices and be able to run Doom on it without modifying the device, without having to take it apart or anything like that. I think we can get there, but it's clear that using the SD card slot isn't really gonna be an option because it's not externally accessible, plus, You've got that little bit of a pain in having to get into the boot menu and you can't always hit F12 with the right timing. So then you've got to keep rebooting this thing over and over to try and get that timing just right. It's a little bit frustrating. Now, let me show you what I ended up with. Yeah, it boots straight to Windows. Apparently the boot order is such that if you have a USB flash drive or hard drive or something plugged in, that's actually higher in the priority list than the built-in flash slash virtual floppy disk. It was telling me that if I wanted to plug in a PS2 mouse, you know, I could do so, or a serial one. I don't have a serial mouse, even though this device has serial ports on it. And I don't have one of those PS2 splitters to hook up both the keyboard and the mouse to the one PS2 port at the same time. This thing sure isn't the fastest, but we're at the desktop. Obviously, very basic colors and no mouse, so we're kicking it old school with navigating entirely through the keyboard. And I get to remember all the key commands. Uh, I definitely want to do Alt-W to turn that off. Um, let's take a look. Here's a major limiting factor, is this hardware was never meant to run Windows 98. So drivers are going to be a bit of a problem. Um, if we go into system and tab over to device manager, so yeah, it's, it's missing a mouse. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, there is no display adapter. It's just got the standard VGA one, which you kind of expect. Complaining about the mouse, the big problem, even though it sees some of the onboard hardware, like it sees the two serial ports just fine. Um, the big limiting factor is it doesn't see a plug and play BIOS. Where that's a limiting factor is that means no USB. Even though this is Windows 98 second edition that is supposed to have adequate USB support, so I could plug in a USB mouse, it can't interrogate the BIOS correctly on this hardware to know what all features are available. So it never sees the USB controller in the hardware. The other thing that I found that's really unfortunate is if we go into my computer, so you can see we've got our C drive and we've also got the floppy drive. Windows 98 will detect that virtual floppy drive, that's the flash chip, on the board. The problem, and I totally spaced on this earlier, is Windows, when you access a floppy disk in Windows, it apparently likes to make a minor little change to the first couple sectors on the floppy disk. And in the vast majority of cases, this change is completely inconsequential. Um, but in this case, well, huh. I, I accidentally opened up the A drive because I wanted to copy the files off of it, all those like what we had seen in DOS, just as a backup, just in case, right? Well, when I opened the A drive, it made that little update. And um, well, if you uh, go and reboot, and I'm gonna let it go ahead and try to start up like normal. Yeah, Windows kind of bricked it. This unit is permanently stuck at the booting from floppy screen now because apparently those first couple sectors on the disk actually do matter, at least when it comes to XDOS. Uh, basically, I think Windows overwrote the little bit that tells the A drive it is bootable. So conceivably, this could get fixed. I could boot this thing into DOS, reformat the A drive, make it bootable, and then copy all the files back onto it. I just haven't done it yet, but yeah, Windows just totally nuked this thing. <laughs> so now I have no choice but to boot from some other media. 
So the next OS that made the most sense to me at least was Windows XP. But before I got too deep into it, I wanted to do some research to see if it was even possible, if I would end up with the same driver compatibility or lack, th lack thereof rather with this hardware under XP as I did with 98. I learned something really interesting. So we talked last time that the CPU and graphics chipset are manufactured by a company called DM&P. What's interesting is that the same CPU and graphics chip are sold on a board called the 86 Duino. It's meant to be kind of an embedded computing board, more to be like a more powerful Arduino or Raspberry Pi kind of replacement, that sort of thing. Not so much just a small general purpose PC. But I did discover that the 86 Duino, in addition to Linux and a bunch of other open source OSs, it does support Windows XP, and you can even download a driver pack for that board from the manufacturer's website. What's also interesting, the 86 Duino, it's owned by DM&P. So the company that made the chips on this board also make another board that's very similar in architecture and offers drivers for it. So the gears got turning in my head and I figured, all right, I can get XP installed on this because chances are the drivers would work fine. Boy, did I have problems with that. <laughs> I figured booting from USB and installing to USB was going to be the easiest thing, just because of what we talked about with kind of the frustrations of dealing with the SD card. So I made a bootable USB installer for Windows XP. I'll include the links to the tools I use down in the description in case you want to be crazy like me and try to do the same thing. The initial parts of it worked fine. I was able to boot into setup, get the setup actually started. The text mode portion of the XP install went through without a hitch. But when I got into the graphical portion of the setup after the first reboot, it just kept throwing tons and tons of problems my way. Lots of files that it either couldn't copy or had errors when trying to copy. It threw a warning about limited virtual memory. And then it just started blue screening. It just didn't want to finish the installation. So I'm like, okay, well maybe there's something with USB, like trying to install from a USB flash drive to itself. Yeah, the tools you can use to make bootable XP installers are kind of a hack because that's not a way that XP was ever meant to be installed from way back when it came out. So I went super simple and discovered that USB hubs will actually work with this hardware as well. So I plugged in a powered USB hub and an external USB CD-ROM drive and broke out one of my standard XP install disks and then tried installing to either the USB flash drive or the SD card just to see if maybe the installation method was a factor. I still ended up with lots of problems. Installing from the CD-ROM drive to the SD card took about forever. It threw a couple of errors. It wasn't a huge deal, except when it went to reboot for the first time into graphical setup, it just straight up blue screened and just wouldn't go anywhere. I know it is possible to install Windows XP on this specific hardware, the Oasis iPad, because one of my Twitter followers who bought one of these was able to do it. And there's obviously some steps that I'm missing, or maybe there's something different in the revision of hardware that I have and they have that's throwing this thing for a loop. I can't say for sure, but after a lot of time screwing around trying to get XP installed, I decided to throw in the towel. Then I got to thinking, okay, well, you know, XP doesn't work because it is kind of a hack to install through USB and all that kind of stuff. What about something like Vista or Windows 7? So I made up a Windows 7 install USB. I couldn't even get it to boot Windows PE. And I'll include a link to a video that kind of explains all about Windows PE and the struggles of trying to install newer OSs on older hardware. It basically 128 megabytes of RAM is not enough to even start the installer for Windows 7 when booted from a USB flash drive. There may be a way that I can clone a full Windows 7 setup to a USB flash drive. Also, <laughs> I learned during that whole XP install saga that this CPU tends to run 
kind of hot. I, I think this is more about like the way this product was designed to normally work instead of worst case scenario. But when you put this thing back together, the thermal pad doesn't actually touch anything. The ribbon cable for the membrane gets in the way. You would think that, oh, the top of this would touch the, you know, stainless steel casing and the casing would act like a heat sink. Um, no, nope. It's just this thing is the only form of cooling for that SOC at all. Um, maybe there's some mods that can be done to help improve that, but a little bit of a design oversight, if you ask me. All right, enough screwing around. Let's finish what we set out to do. Soft modding this thing to play Doom. I figured it out. And I'm not even going to do it on this hardware. I'm going to do it on the other one, just as proof that it is possible with an unmodified one of these units. Conceivably, you could walk up to any one of these, and as long as it's got the USB port that's accessible on the end, this will work. Also, because we know that this thing supports USB hubs, you can conceivably use a USB keyboard with it. I'm just going to keep using the PS2 adapter because I find that easier. But you could get like a keyboard that has a USB hub built into it and plug your flash drive into that. And then you would just have one cable to plug into this device in order to do this. I'm going to call it the soft mod. I'm sure some of you are going to argue with me. But I've got another USB flash drive here. I don't get this whole device banana business, but this is MS-DOS 622. A full install of MS-DOS 622. And I have the Doom installer copied to it. So let's go for it. I believe it did use that as drive C. Uh, we'll just go into Doom. This is the shareware version I should mention just to make things easier. I'm sure it'll run the full version just fine. One thing that I do have to give a little bit of a caveat to, I really, really wanted to be able to get the membrane buttons on here to control the game, but I'm pretty sure these are connected through GPIO and I have no idea what would be involved in like writing a driver or whatever to have the GPIO input mimic either a keyboard or a, a joystick or something like that. So unfortunately, you do have to use an external keyboard in order to control the game. I know I'm disappointed too, but it, it does work. Um, in this case, there is no sound, which is the other major limiting factor to this hardware and why I just can't recommend it if you want to have some sort of weird retro DOS gaming device. There is no built-in audio and there's no way to add it. There's no expansion cards or anything like that. So all the best you can get really is just the PC speaker. Um, so I have to say no music and on this one, just PC speaker. But save parameters and launch Doom, you bet. Yeah, rock on, check it. And you even get all the PC speaker boops and beeps as they actually don't sound too horrible if you ask me, but I mean, it's totally controllable, right? As it should be. But yeah, I mean, this is totally playable. I'm actually surprised at how playable this is. I mean, granted, it, it sucks that there's no music or real good sound effects or anything, but the frame rate seems to be, you know, surprisingly high, like just moving around and everything. It's surprisingly smooth. Uh, I think the graphics chipset is limited to resolution of like 1024 by 768 or something like that. Get over here. Thank you. But uh, yeah, there you go. We're playing Doom on a kitchen appliance. <laughs> Maybe there's more that can be done with this hardware. I definitely think that there's tinkering left to do, but I just kind of ran out of time. I didn't want to spend too much on just this one thing to keep coming up with dead end after dead end. It, you can understand that gets really frustrating, but I'm really happy that I was able to get this thing all put together and it was actually surprisingly easy. So again, I'll include links to a lot of the tools and processes that I followed to build like the bootable USB flash drive with DOS on it, the XP one, the Windows 98 one, like the SD card and stuff. Um, if you want to 
follow along, or maybe they're useful if you find another similar embedded device. Uh, I can't say for sure because the hardware is kind of all over the place, but if anything, maybe they'll help you on your own weird hardware retro gaming quest. Anyway, if you like this one, I would appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.